Good afternoon. Today is December 14, 1998. We're here at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts, and continuing our Veterans Oral History Project, today we have the pleasure of interviewing Connie Nippert Walsh. Good afternoon, Connie. Hi, Joan. How are you? Pretty nervous. But are you? Okay. Well, we'll try to calm you down. Okay. Can you just tell me your address where you're living right now? I live here in Natick. In Natick. And your marital status? I'm married. Your husband's name? Stephen Walsh. And do you mind my asking you your age? I'm 52. 52 years old. And do you have children and grandchildren? I have two children of my own, Gabrielle and Benjamin. And I have three stepchildren, Jason, Tara, and Patrick. And I have a step-grandchild, Jason's daughter. And what Jordan. is her name? Jordan. Jordan. Where were you born? I was born in Kentucky, Lexington, Kentucky. And were you raised in that area? No, my father was a career Navy officer, so um, we moved a lot. I've been all over the United States. So were you considered a brat, so to no, speak? The no, the Army kids Army were brats. brats. I was a Navy junior. A Navy junior. Right. Did you enjoy that experience going all around? Very much. How do you f feel that it affected you from youth to adulthood? Um, there were good and bad effects of it. I think one of the good effects of being a Navy junior, besides seeing the country and uh, learning a lot about the differences in the country, was the constant need to be in new situations meant I had to constantly learn how to make friends. So I'm pretty adaptable. And um, I'm pretty adaptable. I think that one of the unfortunate parts of growing up um, moving around quite a bit, and I guess that's true whether you're military or, or a business, somebody relocating a lot because of business, is that um, I really never got a chance to see anybody grow up. Um, we would meet people and then we would never see them again, with the exception of my grandparents, whom we got to visit every year or two. Um, I never had any constant in my life, um, and that was very difficult. Mm -hmm. What parts of the U.S. do you remember liking the most in your moves? Hawaii. <laughs> you, did you live in Hawaii? Yeah, I lived in Hawaii. I loved Hawaii. I liked um, Charlottesville, Virginia, which was um, a place we lived for only nine months, but it was out in the country. It wasn't actually in Charlottesville, but I loved living in Virginia. Um, How did your mother adapt to this? I think it was a very hard life for my mother. I was the oldest child. My father was away at times. He was away once for a year and a half when she had three tiny children on the other side of the country from her family. She lived in Seattle at the time. It was very difficult for a military wife, but they did it because they were in the military too. Sure. Yeah. What made you decide to enter the military? Tell us a little bit about uh, backing up a little high school, graduation after high school, and then Military. I think I'd like to go even earlier. Sure. I think if you grew up as a military child, um, I, I can only speak for myself, of course. Um, um, I really admired the military. I admired the fathers all seemed so handsome in their uniforms and the mothers. Um, seemed to know what they were doing. It was a very good kind of a life. I think that there were events for families and so forth, but even more importantly, when, um, when I was very young, in third and fourth grade, we lived on the Memphis Naval Air Station at Millington, Tennessee, and it was my only time living on an actual military base. And I, I'll just never forget how patri I think my patriotism was born there. Um, the, it was really something to see and to be living right on the edge of such a very large military establishment. It was a naval air station and they would fly planes in from all over the country at times. And if there was a hurricane in the south, the Florida planes and so forth might be sent up you know, to, for safekeeping and land up there. So it was constantly seeing a lot of power, big machines. Um, but the base really evol revolved around um, I think, or for us as children, when the flag went up and the flag went down, when they played taps in the evening, the cars would stop, 
Um, the men would salute if they were in uniform. People would get out, put their hands over their heart, and face where the main flagpole was. And I'll just never forget the impact that had on me as a small child. I grew up very patriotic. I sang all the songs. And this you know. would have been in the 50s. Right, mm -hmm. in the 50s. 1950s. Right. So there was a real love of country. A very deep love of country. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I wouldn't say I was crazy about the military. It was just it was just what one did, mm -hmm. yeah. And so, getting back to your other question, I went to um, part of my story is that I was a little sheltered. Um, my father, when we moved to Newport, Rhode Island, um, he had a three-year tour of duty, and I would have had to leave at the end of my junior year. And my father and mother decided to re-up for another tour in Newport so that I could finish in the same high school. And when I say I was sheltered, I went to a Catholic girls high school. And then I went on to a Catholic girls college that was in Emmitsburg, Maryland. So um, I'm not sure eight years of being cloistered prepares one to be in the world of men, which the military certainly was when I went in the military. But um, that's just part of my story. And when did you go into the military? Um, in 1967, um, there was, I went to a college in Emmitsburg, Maryland, St. Joseph College, and our nursing class was a class of 80 young women. And our school doubled its tuition while we were, I think, at the end of our sophomore year. So a lot of us, being the leading edge of the baby boom generation, um, really were the older kids in our family. And I felt a duty to try and keep the cost down um, for my other uh, siblings so that they had a chance at going to college. And the military at that time, because of Vietnam, had a very attractive deal for uh, college-educated nurses. They would pay your senior year if you would serve two years in return, and they'd pay your senior and junior year if you wanted to give three years back to the service. And so of our class of 40 women, 20 of us went in the military, which was really huge. It's a high 50%. 50 percent went in sure. the military. It was the height of the Vietnam War. Well, it wasn't, I'm not sure it was the height, but it was 1967. So I can never remember, I, I could do the research if it was, the split was 9 and 11, and I don't know if it was 9, I think it was 9 Army, 11 Navy, but I'm not sure it could have been the other way around. So you made the decision as a junior or a senior to? I decided I would serve, I would be in my senior year and give two years back. So the entire time one was in school, one was in the military. You enlisted prior to your senior year, we were enlisted people for the first half of the year, and in December I was commissioned an ensign in the Navy. And we were paid an ensign salary, believe it or not, to go to school. We thought we were quite wealthy, and we, by standards, we were. Do you remember what the pay scale was then? No, but it was nothing like it is now. And as a commissioned ensign, where did you go from college? Um, from college, uh, I had some time off before I had to report for basic training in August. Um, my family still lived in Newport, Rhode Island, so I worked in a hospital in Newport, Rhode Island. And then uh, basic training was in Newport, Rhode Island, so that was very, that I didn't get to go well. away. Um, How long was your training? I think it was about four weeks. Do you remember daily what it was like? You had had some nursing experience already. So was your training in nursing or in the military field? No, the training was in the military field totally. It was, and it was nothing as strenuous as what the line officers, the, um, the men had to go through. Um, it was kind of, I don't mean it was a joke, but it was common knowledge that we had a very fluffy um, indoctrination. But we still had to march, we still had to sit through classes. I could never understand. They would. Um, they would encourage us to, or we'd have, we'd have lunch, and at lunch at the officer's mess they would have wine flowing in fountains, and then we would go back to class and try to stay awake in the hot August afternoon. Um, it was rather difficult to do. But while we were in basic training, one thing that we did see were films that, and I can remember, um, 
they made a big impression on me. It was very clearly denoted in the films that the war depended on um, the men overseas. Um, we were the Navy, so the Marines, we were helping the Marines in the field, and the Navy nurse trained the Navy corpsman. Sorry. That's okay. And the corpsman had to be good. Mm -hmm. And the Marines, it was drummed into our heads, the Marines would take very good care of a good Navy corpsman because their lives depended on a Navy corpsman. And so in some ways, I think I believed that um, my, I know I believed that my job was to train the corpsmen to be the very best corpsmen they could be so they could take the very best care of the Marines so that they could win this war and get people home. So explain what a Navy corpsman would be doing with the Marines. Well, a Navy corpsman, and I know that we have several Marines in the room right now as we're taping, so I'm afraid I might say something wrong. I don't know what the right words are, whether it's, you know, the small units. But a corpsman would be assigned to be with the Marines, and should a Marine be injured, the corpsman, it was his job to stable, you know, to stabilize, to do emergency treatment in the field, um, to do emergency treatment, stabilize um, the person, and, and really maximize their chance of survival. And it was just, they were extremely important. So they're similar to a medic in, they were in a medic in common the, in, in the army, terms. you call it a medic. Mm -hmm. In the Navy, it was a corpsman. And, and quite these, often, these corpsmen could also be on Navy ships? They could be on Navy ships, but that was unusual. There they weren't were, that many Navy ships that I can think of. There was the hospital ship repos, and actually one of the reasons that I wanted to go in the military was I very much wanted to be on the hospital ship repose. Um, but it was common knowledge that for a nurse to get on the repose, she would have had to have completed her first tour of duty. So you had to do your first tour of duty and then go in. Um, I chose the Navy over the Army, obviously for reasons of loyalty, but also um, if I enlisted in the Navy, I it was a sure thing that I got a choice of eight, I mean, there were eight possibilities where I could be sent. And we could put in for our preference, but that didn't mean we would get it. But all eight places were doable as far as I was concerned. They were all on the coast. And, but if I enlisted in the Army, there was a chance that I could be sent anywhere. And there were a lot more places that were not attractive to me that I might be sent. So it was an issue of some control over my destiny, I think. And did you, in controlling your destiny, did you have the sense that you would remain in state, in, in the U.S.? Oh, I knew I would. You would. Mm -hmm. Because in the Navy, you, the first tour of duty, you had to stay stateside in one of these large eight hospitals. And what was your priority? Do you, do you remember, was Where it I wanted Rhode to Island? Go? Mm -hmm. No, I wanted to go to Oakland. Um, I think I wanted to go to the Oakland Naval Hospital, but I, Got, I think my second choice for, was um, Portsmouth Naval Hospital in Norfolk, Virginia, and that's where I was sent. What was it like going to Portsmouth, and do you remember how you got there? Oh, yes, vividly. Tell us it's about one of the that. great memories of my life. Um, well, we graduated June 5th of 1968. Um, and one of my college classmates and I were going to be roommates, and I can remember getting in her little yellow opal car and heading south to find our apartment where we were going to live, and it was so exciting. This was before we actually were, you know, through basic training, but we did go down and, you know, find a place to live and so forth, and it just felt like the whole world was opening before us. We were, you know, independent. Our parents weren't going, you know, we were just the utter exhilaration of thinking the sky was the limit, we could do anything, and we felt so grown up. And I remember what we had to eat for dinner that night. We went out to dinner after we found we had prime rib at some restaurant. Oh, I just thought I was something else. And was this a, f a friend from college, a yeah, roommate? Yeah, a classmate. Or, mm -hmm. Yeah, another did, nurse. Did you stay friends with her throughout your career? Um, do you mean in the Navy? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, we lived together mm -hmm. until she married and left the Navy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Do you still did you still maintain a contact with um, her after? Not so much. We for years we did and sent Christmas cards, but over the years, you know, just kind of petered out somewhat. But we're still glad to see each other at college reunions and things. Sure. So along with college, you had that other relationship with her as being a Navy nurse at the same time. Mm -hmm. So tell us more about your experiences. As a Navy nurse? Mm -hmm. I kind of divide it in half. There was the first year um, of active duty and then the second year of active duty. The first year of active duty, um, well to begin with, um, it was a very large place than the Portsmouth Naval Hospital. It was 11 stories, 12 stories high, and each story was like a T. So there were approximately three units on each story. So it was very, very large. And the, um, we had not only people from the Norfolk area, but also we had um, foreign military who would be patients. We had certainly a large number of patients from Vietnam. Um, because the Marine and Navy and all the fellows when they came back went to the hospital closest to their families usually or the specialty hospitals and so it was a very large very busy place and I had my orientation on a women's dependent floor I think and then got assigned to a medical floor and one day um, a rather tyrannical woman supervisor. Um, I just happened to be doing something that was a high priority of hers and so she decided she would make me a head nurse before other people who were senior to me. So I paid for that one big time with my colleagues. I really was made a head nurse at much too young an age. I think one thing I want to impress in this interview is that I was 21 years old with a college education, which in those days as a nurse meant I didn't have a lot of experience. I had the education, but not the hands-on experience. You weren't on the floor a lot as right. far as being in a hospital situation. Right. I mean, I had adequate to be safe, but, excuse me, but um, I didn't have a lot of experience with patients. Mm -hmm. And in the Navy, you got a lot of experience very fast, and good experience, too. So that first year was a year of learning. It was a year of um, not making a mistake twice. I made a lot of mistakes in the beginning. I think it's part of the learning curve whenever we're a novice in something. Um, I had excellent education and leadership skills. That was another thing I forgot to say about my basic training. I think we were, as officers, um, given very excellent education and leadership. I think that leadership uh, education has marked me well over the years. I've had a number of leadership positions and a lot of it goes back to my Navy training. Um, so that first year was a year of continuing to be a very patriotic, serve my country, rah-rah, um, learning how to be a good nurse, learning how to run a floor. Um, that was difficult. I was put in charge of a floor with 34 male patients, 8 male corpsmen, three male physicians, and I was the only woman, and I really didn't know anything about men. I didn't know anything about the world. I'd been in Catholic girls' schools for eight years. It was rather traumatic. So I was kind of just struggling to survive and, and um, learn. At that time, were any of the male nurses, male doctors, male patients, um, helpful to you in any way in helping you to learn? Oh, everybody was helpful. It was a wonderful time. There was wonderful camaraderie. Um, the physicians, I had a physician that I worked with who was one of the finest physicians I ever worked with, um, Dr. Harry Maxson. And he was just a very idealistic young man. I was an idealistic young woman. Um, we just, uh, he had, I think he and his family were from Louisiana. He was a wonderful man high ideals. Um, I worked with wonderful people. A lot of people say the military, over the years I've heard so many things about the military, I happen to work with wonderful people. So I was lucky. I guess not everybody has that experience, but I worked with wonderful people. My supervisors were wonderful people. Um, you had mentioned um, earlier that some of your patients were patients from Vietnam. Was this, seeing them come in 
um, after their experiences in the war. Did this change your attitude at all, or did it? It very much changed my attitude. Um, I think um, person by person you would hear stories of things. And the stories were very upsetting. At first I didn't want to believe these things were true and I thought, why are they saying these things? I just couldn't believe that these things were true. Such as what? Do you remember um, any of them? No, I think I've kind of blocked that out. I remember coming on the unit one evening when I was on and there was a cluster. This was in the days of open wards. There was a long, long ward and there were probably, you know, 18 beds on one side and or 16 beds on one side, 16 on the other, whatever. And um, seeing a whole bunch of people clustered around one bed and going up to find out, well, what's going on? And they were sitting there listening to a tape someone had sent them. And they, somebody had sent them from the field. And, and now, looking back on it, I think the men were just kind of processing and, com and talking about their experiences. But I was kind of shocked. And I don't even remember what the subject was. I think this is common with vets from the Vietnam era. There's a lot of things that we don't remember, you know. Mm -hmm. I think there was a lot of um, denial for me in the beginning. And there were other things. There were, um, I remember we had a very well-educated young man on my floor who was on kidney dialysis and uh, because he had been marching in the hot sun uh, down at, Camp Lejeune or something, and they had marched him and marched him until he went into kidney shutdown. And um, it was unclear if he would, I think he was a biochemist, PhD, enlisted fellow, a very nice fellow, but his future was kind of grim at that point. And um, there were just lots and lots of stories, lots and lots of stories, and I can still see just about all of them in my mind. And they're all just that same age, frozen in time. When you mentioned that one of your major um, jobs would be to train the Navy Corpsmen, was that immediate? Was that the first year also that you were involved? You were constantly training the Corpsmen. These were young boys. And I can't, if I was a young girl, these boys were younger than I was for the most part. And they, some of them were opting to be corpsmen because they, the, I'm, I'm not really sure all the reasons people did, but these were young boys. They had had, I don't remember if it was six or eight weeks of hospital corps school in Great Lakes, out in the Great Lakes. And then they came to all the different big hospitals and they were apprenticed much, they were just serving an apprenticeship and so they had to learn everything there on the floor. They had had some basics like how to take temperatures but these are the same kids that could be graduating from Natick High you know and then they're shipped off you know to basic training and core school, corpsman school and then off to you know maybe spend a couple of months in a hospital and then they were in Vietnam with the Marines and so it was very clear that you had, I had to train these people, and these people were taking care of my patients. So at any time, there was a constant turnover of, of corpsmen coming through, and I had to train them so that they could take care of the patients on my floor. And then the secondary, what was always very primary for me, was making sure they were as skilled as they could be. Um, you know, how to start IVs, they had to know how to start IVs, they had to know how to suture, they had to know a lot of things. So you're looking for opportunities for them all the time so that they could get, you know, what they needed. And um, they were from all over the country, they were, uh, you know, they were in a tough situation and so life was, they were a little crazy, you know. Life was a little nuts. And I walked a very delicate line between being a mother, a sister, a lot of them would want you to be their sweetheart, but you, it was very clear that you had to juggle all this, and I didn't know how to deal with it. I didn't even know how to talk. One of my funny stories, which isn't so funny, but it's, it's still a little painful for me, whoops, I'm not supposed to touch my microphone there, um, was I didn't know, you know, I would, there would be these fellows, and I'd hear these things they'd say when they were upset, and 
some of them really had a mouth on them. They were like in the CBs, you know, they were notorious for cussing and so forth. But I just hear this stuff when people get upset. And so when I'd get upset, I might say these things too, but I didn't even know what they meant. I just say these words. I wouldn't end up not even going to tell you what they are now because now I know what they meant. But once I had a young corpsman who was 18 ask if he could talk with me after work, and we went down to the gidunk, that was the word for the snack bar, and he sat down and said, now Miss Nippert, I know you're a very nice pe person, but some people don't know that. And he said, it's the way you talk. And so he began explaining to me what each word meant, and I know I was as red as a beet. And, uh, you know, after eight years in the like I say, the Catholic girls' school. So that was a very embarrassing. I was afraid to open my mouth from that point on because uh, when you're working with military guys, you don't always know what all these words mean. Sure. Oh. Once some of the corpsmen left to go overseas, did you hear from any of them while they were over there or when they returned? Yeah. Do you want to talk about that at all? Yeah, I think... Um, I, I think that those, those are really something, uh, I can remember one guy who before, and a lot of them were, they were very attractive young men. They were, you know, they were in their prime, they were facing death, uh, and I can remember this one young guy who was a real character, and he went over and he was on, he was a senior corpsman on my floor before um, I got there actually. And I remember him coming back, and sometimes they did these odd things. They would like to tempt fate. They would hide something before they left, and then they'd come back and get it. And this guy had a bag of all kinds of things that he had, like pilfered, you know, syringes and things like that. This paper bag that before he left, he got this little cash together, put it in a paper bag, lifted up one of those ceiling tiles, stuck it up there on the girders, and said, I'll be back for you. And I remember the day he came back and got it. Twelve months later, alive, unwounded, you know. Um, but I remember him saying, I knew I'd, I'd come back and get this. Um, I remember one young fellow on my roommate's floor, which was my sister unit. It was right across the hall from my floor. And he was a wonderful guy, and he went over, but when you know, we'd hear people would get letters and so forth, but we heard that he had become a sniper. And he was a really nice um, Latino corpsman, as nice as there he could be, but he had decided when he was over there that he didn't want to be a corpsman, he wanted to kill people. And it really was shocking to us that this, that what must have happened to him to change him like that. That was one thing. I was engaged to a fellow that went over to Vietnam and came back, thank God. Um, and he would write, and he would write letters to me, and they were wonderful letters. Um, he was quite a writer, and one of my big regrets in life is that I did not save his letters. Um, I eventually married somebody else and felt it was wrong to keep these letters, so I, I got rid of them. But I regret it because he chronicled what it was like in the war. And he was a really fine person. And um, he would write about this friend of his, another corpsman named Smitty. And then one day a letter came that Smitty had been blown up and killed. And I've always wished that I had saved those letters for my children to see what war was like. Because they were, he was a, very sensitive young man, and his letters were very poignant, and it was just a wonderful, wonderful thing, which is why I think it's so important for veterans to tell their stories. I may not have been in Vietnam, but I certainly experienced the Vietnam War firsthand. Um, Tell us more about your second year. Your first year was sort of a learning experience. Well, the first year I was in denial of what was going on. Mm -hmm. And there were a few other things that I, I don't want to forget just to mention that were going on. It was a very, very turbulent time. They were burning American cities with race riots. The, um, the Black Panther movement was very strong. Um, there was racism. And this I was just so opposed to any racism. And that was a very difficult thing to deal with. Um, again, as a military officer and a very young woman, if I found out something was going on that shouldn't, I would try to confront the situation and talk with people. And for the first time in my life, 
it was very strange to be almost the subject of reverse discrimination because we had very angry young black um, service men who um, might think I was just trying to be helpful or did not appreciate my efforts or whatever. So I would try to have a dialogue and it was really strange to be um, kind of really trying hard to solve some problems and to experience that. So the racism was a very challenging uh, situation to deal with. Another challenging situation was drugs. I had no experience with drugs. I think that years later when I realized what marijuana smelled like, I realized that it had been all around me and I just had been not even known it was going on. I was so naive, do you know? One of the other things that has come up historically is, is uh, not only the turmoil and turbulence with regards to race, but also the difference of opinion, especially at the college level, um, regarding the war itself. Did you, were you in, in the service at that point in time? Did you experience any of that? Um, I went to this middle-class Catholic small women's college out in the boondocks, Emmitsburg, Maryland. We had a brother school a mile away, Mount St. Mary's College. We were not a center of protest. Um, it was just this sheltered, idyllic, out in the farmlands college. I, again, I think I lived a lot of denial. Um, I had met one fellow who had been in the military and had been to Vietnam. He seemed different. Um, but I really, and we watched Lap In, which was constantly mocking um, all kinds of things. Uh, that was a weekly TV program. And we certainly mm -hmm. saw the news on television all the time, but I don't think we were as, I mean, I have a lot of friends my own age now who were very active in Boston and other places, so I can't explain why we weren't. I just, our minds were elsewhere. We were not that caught up in it. Do you ever remember, though, any kind of situation where in uniform but off the hospital, possibly during free time, that you might have been uh, involved in, in confrontation by others or No, and I'll like tell that? you why. We never left the base in uniform. We were prohibited from doing that. It was so dangerous. And I lived down in the south in uh, Portsmouth, Virginia. You did not, you were not to wear your uniform off base. It was considered very dangerous. So you were mingling with others in civilian clothes and they really didn't know what your right, background, right. background was. That's correct. Tell us about your second year. Well, gradually I became just watching the news, listening to the stories. Um, my floor was a medical floor, which meant that we didn't see a lot of the surgical trauma necessarily on my floor. Um, we got a lot of the tropical diseases uh, from Southeast Asia were, would come to my floor. Um, but on evenings and nights, a military nurse I may have my primary duty to my floor, but then on evenings I had four floors, and on nights I had six floors, and on evenings and nights I did have surgical floors, and I did have patients who were um, returned from Vietnam with all kinds of head and neck trauma and so forth. I had one young man that I met, not, not at my work, but um, I think socially, um, who had a crush on me, and he had had really severe severe abdominal wounds and was constantly, I don't, he probably still has problems for his, from his abdominal wounds. And um, so there was a lot of knowledge. So I guess that second year was a very difficult year because I decided that, um, and here I was a woman of conscience, I was in the military, I was part of this military machine that was doing these things. I saw no way out honorably except to continue doing it, but I protested by wearing it's kind of, um, I kind of did some acting out. I wore peace beads under, under my Navy uniform, you know, but I always had these beads and um, a, a leather thing, excuse me, I keep tapping that microphone, I, under my uniform. And was almost hoping somebody would notice and say something and I could legitimately speak of my angst over all this, but I think I had very wise 
women um, supervisors who probably, had they seen them, chose not to uh, get into a, an encounter with me. Um, Do you ever remember any kind of conversations with some of the senior women or women of your generation getting the sense that possibly their opinions were also changing a bit? We didn't talk about it. Mm. We didn't talk about it then, and um, it's not something that I've had a lot of chance to talk about, which is why I said I've got to do this interview. Mm -hmm. um, I remember one day in the Gidunk, in the snack bar, where one of my colleagues who had another floor on our level, on the 11th floor, had you know, she'd picked up her mail and she just put her head down on the table and was sobbing. She'd gotten a letter from a boy's mother, one of her corpsmen had been killed in Vietnam. And it was like you just constantly, for the mail, you just lived. And uh, the goal was, you know, that every corpsman I sent over there had to come back. And as far as I know, every corpsman I sent came back. How many do you think that was? I don't, I'm sorry, I haven't mm -hmm. a clue. I really haven't a clue. I've never thought about it. Uh, if you have eight corpsmen and they're turning over every couple of months and the majority of them are going over there. That's a lot. Some went to years. pharmacy school. They didn't go to Vietnam. Um, and it was very clear that people did not want to go to Vietnam. Some did. Some did, but most didn't. They did were afraid. Did you get that sense that oh, most yeah. had, if they had the choice, they would have oh, stayed? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But you never talked about that because you had to put the best foot forward. You had to be, um, you had to be, um, and I think that they knew that. I was an officer. They were enlisted. They weren't going to confide about their fears or things like that. Do you know? You just, you did what you had to do. Any other things that really stick out in your mind about that experience with you? Any other characters, funny things, sad things that you'd like to share with us? Um, Even philosophical I had a comments. funny thing happen to me. Mm -hmm. I had a funny thing happen to me. It wasn't all terrible. And it was, um, it was my first encounter as a nurse with the death of a patient that was important to me. It was a 15-year-old boy, a dependent, um, a military dependent. His parents were on the other side of the country. He was 15 and he was dying of leukemia and I was just heartbroken. I felt like a real attachment to him for lots of reasons. And um, I remember I was trying to keep from crying until I got off work. And so finally I was off work and I went to the elevator and finally um, I was able to be alone. The doors were going to close on the elevator. Nobody could see me and I could burst into the tears I'd been holding back all night. He wasn't dead. He was dying. And I wasn't, I didn't know how to deal with it. So the elevator doors closed. And a couple, you know, maybe two floors later, all of a sudden the doors open and this clown jumps into the elevator, grabs me in his arms, dips me, kisses me, and straightens me back up. And I was like in this state of shock. And it was Emmett Kelly, the very famous, um, I think he's Barnum and Bailey clown, the world famous clown Emmett Kelly. And he was there visiting the troops from Vietnam and cheering him up. And uh, so one of the photographers took this picture of him kissing me or, or, or standing there in the elevator with me. And it really made national, um, it was all over the place, probably in military magazines or something. But I got a picture of it. And, so in That's the midst of me. sorrow, you also had a chuckle. Oh yeah, we had lots of chuckles. Yeah. I, I think today, sometimes I remember the pain, but there were lots of good times. There were lots of good times and fabulous people. When, that, when you had time off, what would you normally do to get away from the hospital environment? Um, we'd go to Virginia Beach. Um, you know, there was a lot of partying. We were young people. <laughs> Mm -hmm. There was a lot of partying. You mentioned Emmett Kelly earlier, and I think you brought a photo of it. Why don't you hold it up, see if yeah. we can get it, capture this it on... A, uh, I don't know if it'll show on the videotape, but this is me, Ensign Nippert, with my little one gold stripe, and Emmett Kelly looking sad. And I look a little happy because I was a little startled, to say the least. But um, 
I guess he was sent to me at exactly the right time. Absolutely. Yeah, so that's a picture that we keep at home. You mentioned keeping in contact with your roommate for a while. Were there any other special friendships that you made that you were able to keep in contact with after your service? Um, not really. Um, as I said, I had been engaged to a fellow. He was my senior corpsman. He went overseas and um, luckily came back. And um, I kind of did a Dear John thing, which was unthinkable, and felt very, very guilty about that. And years later, um, when my marriage ended, I had written him a letter telling him that I'd gotten what I deserved. You know, the marriage had ended, and he wrote me a very kind, very compassionate letter back saying how um, I had gotten him through the war and um, he would never wish me to have unhappiness. And he was so very kind. It was one of the kindest things I think anyone's ever done for me. Do you know what he's doing today? No, I haven't heard from him since that letter. I just thought, I know he's married and lives in Texas and hopefully has a family and hopefully is very happy and successful. Mm -hmm. So you were both good for each other at a certain point in your lives. I think everybody we knew helped each other. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, you know, war is a very tough thing. And um, it's a very tough thing. Besides seeing the um, Vietnam veterans coming back and some injured or with some diseases, as you mentioned, um, were you able to or were you interested in keeping track of the war via the newspaper or the news? And how did you respond to some of that if you did? I just wanted it over. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'm not sure I understand fully your question. I watched the news. I never marched in marches. Um, actually, they weren't that easy to get to, and I was a pretty busy person. Um, but I just wanted it over. And I don't think I was ever really happy until um, it was over. I think I had a hard time enjoying holidays when everybody should be happy. All I could think about was, you know, prisoners of war and so forth. It was very difficult. During the 69, 60, you were in 67 to 70. Mm -hmm. Were you getting a sense then that there was a lot of um, disbelief in what was being reported, or do you remember any of that? Hmm that maybe some of the information wasn't as factual as you were hearing from some of the soldiers? Um, yeah, I think that there was a lot of disbelief about the numbers, about things. I think there was, you know, I think one of the things I probably blocked about was people talking about how important the numbers were and how to get the numbers at any cost. And the numbers meaning numbers of deaths, numbers of Viet Cong, Viet kill. Cong kills yeah. versus the loss on our side, etc. Right, mm -hmm. right. After you were finishing up, did you finish up your tour of duty in mm -hmm. Virginia? So mm -hmm. you had your whole right. tour there. Do you remember your final days there, what it was like? They were very horrible days um, from a whole nother story, another set of circumstances. Um, I had mentioned this fellow that I was engaged to who did go to Vietnam. And while he was gone, I think I was very afraid that he wouldn't come back. And for whatever reason, um, I did meet somebody else who I also worked with. There was a policy in the military, and there still is, against fraternization between officers and enlisted. And for whatever reason, all the Navy nurses dated Navy corpsmen and so forth. I, did, I never found the Navy officers very interesting. They seemed very dull, very boring to me. But these young men seemed to have a lot of life, a lot of, they were much more interesting. And they didn't lie. And they, I mean, I just didn't care for the college-educated officers of my own um, ilk, shall we say. And um, I did date um, and fall in love with a, another corpsman, but it was very clandestine because um, fraternization was 
against military rules, even though everybody did it and everybody knew everybody was doing it. In those days, it was not um, something they cared to spend a lot of time um, punishing people for or disciplining people. But we still were extremely clandestine. So when you say, what did you do on your off time, your off time was usually back at your apartment. Your roommates might know that somebody, uh, that you were dating somebody, but it was kind of clandestine. So I ended up planning a wedding, a very small wedding, and going on leave and coming back a married woman, married to somebody that my corpsman had known, and they were so upset with me. And I only had five more weeks in the Navy left, but boy, they made those five weeks of hell for me. I don't to this day know if they were disappointed in me as their leader that I had done this. They were disappointed because they knew that maybe people knew I had been engaged to this other fellow, and to write a Dear John letter was like the ultimate sin, you know, to a fellow that was serving overseas. I have no idea. But I do know that people, um, what had been very friendly, warm working relationships became very, people were very angry with me, and it was very obvious. So that was a the, the, My men, mm -hmm. my corpsmen, and so forth. And when I left, I was in a really pretty deep depression because there were no goodbyes. We had a tradition on our floor that I had started. Whenever anybody left, I gave them their choice of a German chocolate cake that I bought down the street at the grocery store or something that I made myself. And so there was always a party whenever anybody left, whenever anybody moved on somewhere. There was always a party we always celebrated. And when I left, nobody said goodbye even. And it was extremely painful. And I remember walking out of the hospital and getting in my car, and this brand new in intern, a very young medical officer, um, saying, well, see you Monday. And I said, well, no, actually, you won't see me Monday. This is my last day in the military. And he said, you're kidding. How will we ever exist without you? I can't, how, will the, how will we function without you? He was just a, a flabbergasted that I was leaving. You know, and thank God that God put him in my path leaving that day or nobody would have said goodbye. It was a really painful thing. And I remember going up to Washington, D.C. to join my husband who was in, um, he was working at National Naval Medical Center at Bethesda. He was in the military and um, just sitting in my apartment staring out. I was deeply depressed and, you know, maybe it was the Vietnam war issues, maybe, who knows, but it was, it was a very difficult time for me. Do you get the sense, too, that this was sort of an extension of your family and for family not to say goodbye really hurt? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the military I had nicknames. I had three nicknames. And one of them, when you say family, I was called Mama Nip. Mm -hmm. I was called Big Red for obvious reasons. I was big and I had red hair. And I was called Sweet Polly Purebred. For other obvious reasons, I was because of my naivete, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Once you finished up and you joined your husband, um, how did you pick up your life from there? Well, I was a Navy wife then, mm -hmm. until he got out of the military, and then we. One of the benefits of the service at that time, there was a very attractive GI Bill, and when he got out of the military, we came back to Massachusetts. He was a Massachusetts. Um, resident when he enlisted in Massachusetts was pretty good to its veterans. He got to go to a state school for no tuition and we lived on his GI Bill and I worked part-time as a nurse and we raised our two children and then the marriage only lasted five years. Another very common um, outcome of Vietnam era vets. A lot of our marriages didn't last. We married probably for the wrong reasons, thrown together in wartime. Mm -hmm. And when officially were you discharged from Virginia? Um, in 1970, I believe 1970. it was July of 1970. So then you had a, a marriage that you mentioned lasted five years. You're in Massachusetts, which was new to you. What did you do after the, the marriage broke up? Well, I, I lived out in North Adams because my husband was attending North Adams State College. And after I was divorced, um, it was rather difficult to lead um, a good life as a divorced woman. I had all these, I had all these um, 
propositions from, th there didn't seem to be much of a single life for a person who wanted to be proper. <laughs> and uh, so I had the idea to move to Boston. And um, I was told that a young woman with two children couldn't survive in Boston. It was so expensive. But I always liked a challenge. So to Boston we moved. And I lived in Brookline for years before I moved to Natick. And are you still nursing? Right now I'm taking a sabbatical, although I shouldn't say that. I'm doing some consulting work right now. Um, I had been working as the director of Metro West Hospice here in the area, and I loved that work very much, but had to quit for personal reasons. We've had a lot of family um, needs that have come up. So you, know. you went from serving your country and helping the wounded to serving your area of Metro West and helping the dying. What does that say about you? Just part Com of my generation. Compassion. If someone had to say oh, three or four adjectives. I have often been called caring. In fact, just about every time I'm, I'm described, that word comes up. Mm -hmm. How important do you think serving in the military was for you? You know, with everything I've said, I'd do it again. Mm -hmm. I believe, you know, I really kind of like how Israel does it, how everybody serves in the military. Um, we have a country that is so great, and one thing I'll always be grateful to Ronald Reagan for is that patriotism again came back into being while he was our president. It was a terrible thing to see flags burned and so forth. Mm -hmm. For me as a military daughter, it was very painful to see. Oh, it was horrible. It was just a horrible time to live through. Well, you know, it was a terrible time to live through. So I'm sorry, Joan, I've forgotten your question. Well, how important it was to serve. I think it was very important for me to serve, and I think I'd do it again. Um, I know I'd do it again. Um, sometimes I think to myself, I should have stayed in. How would my life have been different? One of my high school classmates is an admiral in the Navy, you know, and. Um, I think that for our country, I, I just so, years ago, I went with my children to Washington, D.C., and I remember going to all the monuments and reading all the inscriptions. And one of the bad points about being a military child when you moved all over the place, you might have just missed the curriculum that taught U.S. history. I really didn't have a real good command of U.S. history. I think I just must have always missed it whenever I got to fourth grade. They had had it in third, or who knows. But I remember reading the words on the monuments that our founding fathers had written. And the place of God and country, do you know, was so very much part of everything. And now I look around and I see my children's friends, our friends, people that are like immigrants, people who have come to this country to make something better for themselves. And with all its problems, it's still the hope of the world. And um, we are strong. We have freedoms that we take for granted. And I don't take them for granted because um, my son's girlfriend grew up in Poland and, and uh, our neighbor grew up in Bolivia. And we know firsthand from so many people that we have had the pleasure and the, and the grace to have, and the blessings to have known what life is like in other parts of the world. And so I don't take my freedoms for granted. And I know that my father, a World War II veteran, fought, went through terrible circumstances so that I could have a better life. And I just feel that um, if there's one message I have to people, it's that our country is great, um, but don't take anything for granted. And um, we need a military to protect ourselves. Um, it needs to be used in the right ways. I abhor war. I abhor violence. Um, and yet I do believe we need a military and a strong military. Mm -hmm. One of the questions that we also ask our veterans, and I certainly would like to get your perspective, not only because you served during the Vietnam era and because you are a woman, um, the difference of public opinion regarding the veterans who served during World War II, such as your dad, the Korean conflict, and those of our peers, our generation. How do you feel about that? Um, in some ways, I feel it's been beaten to death. You know, you hear about it all over the place, and I think, well, what could Connie Walsh say that would add anything to it? But um, um, 
so I, all I can do, I can't talk from an intellectual plane, I can just talk from a personal plane. It's very difficult um, not to be able to talk about it, not to really have anybody want to hear about it, not only because of what we did, but because of how difficult that time was for everybody. One of the reasons I wanted to do this interview was because this past summer um, I had the um, grace to hear three Vietnam era veterans share their story at um, a community gathering in a community that I belonged to since 1982. Two of them I had never met before. One was an army nurse and one of them was my friend Lindsay Fries and I've known Lindsay for over 10 years and I had never heard his story. And these three people sat in a room that was very, were very few veterans in the room of children and grown-ups and grown-ups, I mean adults, children and so forth, probably a hundred and, I don't know, 120 of us sitting there. And they shared their stories and it was so, and they were very frank and they were very, they were very honest and very frank. And I know that I knew they were going to be speaking and I was a nervous wreck weeping before they spoke. Um, it was very powerful for me because this is a community of people that I've known and loved since 1982 and watching the reactions of the people in the room, some of whom had um, been violently demonstrating against servicemen and the guilt that they now felt when they listened to these people and what it was like and how all of these people only wanted to serve their country and some of them didn't even want to serve their country but they felt it was their duty and to come back and to encounter the kinds of things that they encountered was kind of horrible. One interesting thing that came up, you know you always hear about vets were spit on, well none of us had ever really met anybody who had ever been spit on so we don't know if that was really just a rumor you hear but I also know that my daughter um, my daughter's mother-in-law's best friend just lost her only sibling um, and he was a man my age, 52 years old, been in Vietnam, been involved with Agent Orange, had had liver problems ever since Vietnam and finally died so you know the deaths go on mm -hmm. from the Vietnam War and I know this summer listening to Lindsay and Heidi and the other gentlemen talk about I just knew that, and knowing that I was still weeping, um, that I really, when I read in the paper that you were doing this wonderful project here in Natick, um, I just knew I had to participate in it if you needed me, because I think it's important to tell the truth and to heal and to continue healing. Um, I don't, to this day, think that the Vietnam War was an honorable or the conflict wasn't even a war, it was a conflict, it was an honorable one, but I'm not a history student. I don't know that for sure. And I guess you kind of go, I went into the military trusting that, trusting in my elders as I always had, trusting in the, you know, the military as I always had. Is there one other thought that you'd like to leave us with? You've, you've shared so much so eloquently with us as we finish up this interview, is there one other comment you'd like to make before we complete this? Do you think you've covered it all? I guess I just, all that comes to my mind is God bless America. Connie, we'd like to thank you this afternoon for a wonderful interview. Thank you, Joan. It's my pleasure.